Okay, welcome to Level 1 Science Online with any fun of feeling. Hey Year 11s, I hope you are really well um, and that your lockdown is going good. At this stage, when you hear this, we would have heard if we're in an extended lockdown or what's going to happen, so let's hope for the best anyways. Um, the main thing is that we all keep safe. Hey, so on Friday, I asked you to look at some things like um, sex determination and pedigree tr charts and um, the test cross and so forth. Um, and then today we'll just continue with a few more past paper exams, paper examples. Holy moly. Anyways, <laughs> without making it too long, let's continue. Yep, so in the previous video you saw that. You looked at Huntington's disease. Um, so here we go. In 2013, there was an eye color question. So the allele for brown eyes is is dominant over the allele for blue eyes in humans. Discuss how it would be possible for a child to have blue eyes even though both parents have brown eyes. In your answer, you should use a labeled Punnett square. Link the genotypes and phenotypes of the child and the parents and their grandparents. So we did this one in class as well. So there's your Punnett square. The only way that a child um, of two brown-eyed parents can have blue eyes uh, with a recessive is if both parents had a recessive gene present. So in other words, they are heterozygous. Okay, and in the Punnett square, when you draw it, you can then show that there is a 25% chance of the child having blue eyes and in this case the phenotype ratio remember phenotype is the physical feature is going to be three to one three browns to one bl blue okay now the parents both have to be heterozygotes which means that from their parents the grandparents they could they had to inherit one, recess one recessive and one dominant, which means that at least one of the grandparents were brown-eyed because they contained the, the brown allele. Whereas the little bee could have come from a heterozygous grandparent or it could have come from a homozygous recessive grandparent. Okay, so here's the, the model answer for the child to have blue eyes. They must have a genotype of little bee, little bee, or homozygous recessive. If a dominant allele B is present, then brown eyes will be seen. In order to have a genotype of homozygous recessive, each parent must have given a little B. Both parents have brown eyes, so therefore they must have a dominant allele, big B. And because each parent passes on a recessive allele, the genotype of each parent must be heterozygous. The grandparents could have a genotype of homozygous recessive, heterozygous or um, homozygous dominant. It's not possible to say for sure, but at least one of the grandparents on each side had to have passed on the recessive allele in order for each parent to have a recessive allele to pass on to the child. Bunnett squares may be used to show this, but it must be explained. I think we covered that really well. Okay, so here we go. Here's some sheep. Sheep wool colored. And this is for achieved. An animal breeder wanted to produce sheep with white wool. But some white wool sheep produced lambs that had black wool. Oh no. Baba black sheep. Animal breeders often use one male sheep to mate with all their female sheep. Give all the possible genotypes for each phenotype. Use an A to represent the dominant allele for white wool and a little a the recessive allele for black wool. So that's easy for achieved. It is basically homozygous dominant, heterozygous, and homozygous recessive for a black sheep. Okay. So now, can you see how we jump from achieve to excellence? Discuss how a farmer could develop a group of sheep that are pure breeding for white wool. It's a test cross, remember? There we go. In your answer, you should state the genotypes of the male and female sheep the farmer should use to breed from 
explain how the animal breeder can determine the genotype of the male and female to produce sheep that all have white wool. You should include at least two Punnett squares in your explanation. Explain how the animal breeder could make sure that the offspring would always uh, would always be pure breeding. Explain how the animal breeder could make sure that the offspring would always be pure breeding. Okay, can you pause the video here please and then see how you can answer that on a piece of paper. I'll be right here when you come back. Okay, so what is a test cross? The test cross is where you take a known recessive phenotype, so in other words, you're going to take a black in black wool sheep individual and cross it with a white wool sheep individual. And if you do that, let me just get my pen here. So the black wool is going to be ooh, little a, little a, and then you're going to cross that with a, hopefully, a big A, big A, which is going to be white wool. However, to make sure that it is not big A, little a, sorry, it's not that easy to write with a mouse, um, we're going to have to do a test cross. So you take this guy for both of them, so there's my Punnett square. And here's my next Punnett square. And we'll, get, we'll put that little A over here. And a little A over here. And a little A over here. Okay, so now we have A. And A. So that is a white sheep. And A. And A. And that is a white sheep. But over here we have two littles. I'm just going to draw little circles. Okay, so if this was the case, then we would have a 50% chance of every fertilization being a white sheep. But that actually means that you also have a 50% chance that it will be a black sheep. So, whereas on this side, the other side, because we have a homozygous dominant individual, all of the offspring will be white wooled. And that is what the farmer is going to monitor for. He is going to have to monitor the offspring of these two individuals. And the more white babies this individual here produces, the higher the probability that he, that he is homozygous dominant. However, we can never say 100% for sure because if he was over here, there's always a 50% chance for every fertilization that he's going to produce a white wool. So the farmer needs to always maintain vigilance and ensure that he looks and um, constantly monitor. And the moment he sees a black sheep, then he knows that the ram or the you that we, he was using is not a purebred animal. Okay, so those are the two um, Punnett squares that you're going to have to draw and basically the explanation that you're going to give. You have to say things like he has to continue to monitor them because there's a 50% chance that he will produce white and 50% that he will use, produce black. So the model answer to breed a group of white sheep, a breeder should use sheep that are both um, homozygous dominant. Okay, the breeder can determine if a sheep is homozygous dominant by crossing a white sheep with a black sheep because we know that the black sheep, because it's recessive, they have to be homozygous recessive. If the white sheep is homozygous dominant, none of the offspring will be black. The breeder would need to carry out many crosses to show that it was not just due to chance that a black sheep has not been produced. That's the 50% chance I spoke about. If black offspring is produced, the breeder can be certain that the white parent was a heterozygote. So if a black sheep pops out, you know that that little a had to come from the white sheep. Because the black sheep can only give a little a. 
the farmer should need only should only breed homozygous dominant males with white wool with homozygous dominant females with white wool to ensure that the offspring are all purebred white. Ideally, the breeder would use that, and this will remove recessive alleles from the group. Okay, that was easy for excellence. Now, here we have tongue rollers. So, where's our... In the family tree below, people who are tongue rollers are shown as a weird little U face. While those who cannot roll their tongue are shown as smiley faces. Use T and little t to represent the alleles for tongue rolling and non-tongue rolling. Make sure guys, if you do use a little t, that you're using a little t in this shape. It has to have that tail. You can't just make a small t like that. Because which one is now a big t and which one is a little t? You understand? So make sure if it's a little t that you use that. Okay, so use the family tree below to work out the genotype of individual 5. Well, but he's a non Um Explain how you work this out. You can immediately see that they just have they are not tongue rollers, and non-tongue rollers are recessive. So he has to be homozygous recessive. There we go. Okay. Um, if a dominant allele was present, then individual 5 would be a tongue roller. So therefore, they must have both recessive alleles present. Yeah. Easy peasy. So use the family tree to explain why individual 6 must be heterozygous. Okay. Why is individual 6 heterozygous. Now, if you look at this individual here, we know that he displays the recessive gene, or the recessive phenotype. So he has to be homozygous recessive. Yep. So this dad can only give a little t. Do you agree? And this dad can still only give a little t. Whereas this mom, she has to have at least one big t because she's a tongue roller. However, both her children are not tongue rollers. And to be a not tongue roller, you have to have little t's. So that means that she has to have a little t. Otherwise, Individual 10 and 11 cannot be there. There you go. So for merit, individual 6 is a tongue roller. And so must have at least one dominant allele present for tongue rolling to be expressed. Both of the 6's children are non-tongue rollers, which means they must both receive, uh, must have both recessive alleles to be little t, little t. Because they've got one allele from each parent, and individual 5 can only pass a recessive allele. This means that individual 6 must have another recessive allele present. And so for the mother must have at least one recessive allele. Okay. Um, and they have to have a dominant to be, so they are heterozygous. Yep, we proved that. Nice. Then they continued. Now, okay, we're up to excellence level. So... Draw Punnett squares in the box below. Explain why the genotypes of individual 3 and 4 cannot be homozygous dominant and homozygous recessive. Alright, so let's look at individuals 3 and 4. Here's 3. They say that he might be homozygous dominant. Okay. And individual 4, explain the genotypes for individual, explain why the genotype for individuals 3 and 4, oh sorry, must be that. In your answer you should explain why it cannot, so they have to be heterozygotes, they cannot be homozygotes. Okay, so we're going back to this. So I made a mistake there, this has to be a little t, 
and this has to be a little t according to what they said. Now let's look why. Here we have somebody that is not affected. Okay, that means that their genotype is definitely a little t, little t. And over here we have a tongue roller, which means they have to have at least one and at least one tongue roller. However, if this was a homozygous dominant, if this human was homozygous dominant, all the children would have had um, a dominant allele. So this one, because it's got the two recessive, it means both of these parents had to have a heterozygote because they display it, but they had to give two. Okay. And if she, for instance, was a homozygous non-tongue roller, we would have seen it in the phenotype. So that's why the phenotype shows us that they have to have a dominant, and whereas the offspring's phenotype tells us that they have to each at least give one recessive to this, so they have to be homozygous, oh, sorry, heterozygous. All right, so let me read this. Individual 3 and 4 cannot be homozygous recessive, as they are both tongue rollers. For them to be both tongue rollers, each of them must have at least one dominant allele. So, this precludes, or it means that this cannot be um, as a possible genotype. It is not possible for individual 3 and 4 to be homozygous dominant, as one of their offspring is a non-tongue roller. A non-tongue rolling child must have a genotype homozygous recessive because if they have a dominant at all from one of the parents, they would, um, they would be able to tongue roll. One of each allele must come from each parent. And so, for the child to be a homozygous recessive individual, a recessive allele had to come from each parent. For this to occur, each parent must have a recessive allele well, let's repeat ourselves. Because the parents are both tongue rollers, they each must have a dominant allele. Okay, we've said that. And relevant Punnett squares um, drawn show a crossing of the two. Okay, and here we go. NCA 2015, albino rats. Albinism in rats result in white fur and pink eyes. Albinism is called by a recessive allele, little a. So, the moment we see that, we know that this guy has to be homozygous recessive. Do you agree? And this guy can be dominant. Oh, that looks terrible. But he can be a heterozygote, or he can be a homozygote. Homozygous dominant. Okay, so, complete the following diagram. Now, if we look at this, um, oh, it's just a very complicated um, Punnett square, to be honest, if you look at it. So, if you put the genotype of this guy down, you're going to have homozygous recessive, and this one can be both. Oh, it can't, because they give you that heterozygous black rat. Huh. Sorry. Okay, so now that we know that, if it's heterozygous, we have to put that. Now the gamete is basically, this one can produce, if it's a female, it can produce an egg that has got that in, and it will produce another egg that has got that in, because there's only two possible versions of the allele. Whereas a heterozygous black rat can have a dominant allele, and then in the other sperm, it will have a recessive allele. Okay. And then when we mix these, you can see there is going to be the from the black rat. And here's the other line for the black rat. Okay. And then over here is the little a from the black rat. And the little a from the black rat. Now we go to the white rat, and you can see little a, 
there and a little a there. It really is just a complicated looking Punnett square. So, um, I didn't bring this one down. So you can see that we have a 50% chance of having white offspring and 50% chance of having black heterozygous offspring. And you get and achieve two achieved points for this. Holy moly, that's too easy. So, the albino rat won, and the heterozygous black rat produced the following two generations of offspring as shown in the pedigree chart below. Um, what are the genotypes of the following rats? Rat 4, 6, and 10. Rat 4 is white. And if you're white, you have to have little a, little a, because it's the recessive phenotype. Easy peasy. Rat 6 is from this daddy and this mommy because he has to have at least one big A which he got from the black rat and this one could only give a little A. So 6 is a heterozygote. And then rat 10. Again the mom can only give a little A and the dad can give if he's a heterozygote, we don't know. But we know that he's got at least one big A. So, this one has to be a heterozygote. Okay. There we go. Hmm. Here's the excellence part of that question. Rat 3 was not an offspring of rat 1 and 2 in the family tree. Give the possible genotype of rat 3 and explain why it is most likely, what is the most likely genotype for rat, rat 3. In your answer, you should state the possible genotypes for rat 3. Explain why both genotypes are possible, but one is more likely. Explain why, what you could do to be more certain about this genotype of rat 3. So this what you see over here is basically a test cross. We take a known recessive. So we know every single one of these have to have a little a in them. Okay. Sorry for that line, but I don't know why it does that. And then over here, we know that he has to have at least one dominant allele. So he can be either heterozygous, or he can be homozygous dominant. Now, if you had to say, if there's four fertilizations to every single time give a big A from there and not give a little A, the, statistically speaking, it can definitely happen, but there's a lower chance. So if I look at this, my answer would have been that RAT3 is most likely homozygous dominant. However, it can be homozygous or heterozygous because you only need to give one dominant allele for the rat to be black. However, if you see that we have four offspring so far, so four fertilizations, and if I look at my Punnett square, I know there's a 50% chance that they will be white or black. So to have four black is um, more unlikely. However, to be certain, we have to do more crossings of the same two individuals and if a white rat does appear, then we know that rat number three was a heterozygote. Okay, so here's the answer. The black rat must have at least one dominant A allele because its phenotype is black. However, there are two possible genotypes. These genotypes could result in the following. The pedigree tree provides show that the actual offspring were all black. <laughs> the all black rats. All blacks? No, never mind. Therefore, the most likely genotype for rat 3 is homozygous dominant, as this can only produce black offspring. However, these punnets squares also show the probability of the event occurring where a heterozygote can produce black offspring, which is 50%. So, um, in this case, it might just be chance that white offspring were not produced. To be certain of the genotype of black rat 3, you have to carry out many crosses with a known recessive phenotype or homozygous recessive 
parent. If after a large number of crosses there were no white offspring, you would have confidence that the rat was homozygous dominant, but only one offspring will prove that it is heterozygous. Okay, so the same answer. It's just a different way that they ask the question. Okay. Um, Photic sneezing. Some of you might have that where you walk, when you walk from a dark building into bright sunlight, you sneeze. When you want to sneeze. I know when I want to sneeze, like, you know when you get that itchy nose and I actually can just need to look up at the sun for a moment, then I sneeze. But I don't sneeze immediately when I walk into, into sunlight. But some people do, and it's called photic sneezing. So it's a condition which causes affected people to sneeze due to bright light. It can be traced through a family as shown in the pedigree chart below. Photic sneezing is dominant and unaffected people are recessive. Work out the genotypes of the following individuals. 1, 2, 11, 12. So, when you are affected, you're black. And when you're unaffected, you're white. And to be unaffected is little a, little a. So all the white ones, we can say little a, little a. You guys agree? Okay, I'm not going to draw all of them. However, this guy over here is affected, or this lady over here is affected, so she must have at least one, at least one dominant allele, okay? But she had babies that were unaffected, see that? Three of them actually. So she has to be a heterozygote. There we go. So we've got 1, 2, now 11 and 12. Here's 11. And 11 has got at least... Oh man. Sorry. Um, 11 has got at least 1A. And 12 has got at least 1A. But look at this offspring over there. Because that is there, we know that this has to be little a, little a. So both these parents have to be heterozygotes. Okay, so one day I'll have a drawing tablet and then I'll be work able to work neater, I promise. Okay, anyways, um, there you go. So we've worked that out and that is our achieved question. Then for excellence, explain how the pedigree chart can be used to show that, show that photic sneezing is dominant, but it cannot be used to determine the genotype of individual 13. You must use Punnett squares. So if you look at 11, we know that 11 from 3 could only get a little a. Do you agree? Okay, so 11 has to contain one little a and one big a. So he has to be a heterozygote. But 12, we don't know. We simply do not know. Um, because we don't know what is the second allele here. So that means that he, between 11 and 12, they made this guy who's got either a dominant or a recessive. But look, now this one is little a, little a. So because of that, we suddenly know what is 12's genotype. So it has to be a heterozygote. But can you say if this boy received a dominant from both parents, or maybe one, we simply can't say. Okay, so that is the answer. So 14 is a non-sneezer, but their parents are sneezers. The non-sneezing allele must be hidden in 11 and 12. Hidden means recessive. Alleles can be hidden. Well, there we go. Or if a sneezer was dominant, individual 14 would have. Yeah, if if one of these non-sneezers were homozygous dominant, one of the both of these would have had um, the could not have produced this non-sneezer. Okay, 13 is a sneezer, so must have a dominant allele. They could be capital A or that, as each parent can pass on either um, of the alleles. The Punnett square shows that 25% are expected to be homozygous dominant, and 50% are heterozygous. So you can see there, there's 11 and 12. There's 14, but we don't know if 13 is any one of these three.
Okay. Oh, and here goes test cross. The cross between 1 and 2 in the peregrine chart has one affected sneezing. The cross between 3 and 4. Um, three affected offspring that are sneezing. Explain the difference in number of the affected photic sneezes in the two crosses. One and two, one and two. Again, we have a homozygote and a heterozygote. And three and four is a homozygote recessive. And we know this has to be a heterozygote because from that mom, they could only, or from that dad, they could only get a little. Thing. Okay. So, and also because of this guy over here, we know that 3 and 4, 4 has to be a heterozygote. Alright, now what is our question? Um, the cross between 3 and 4 in the pedigree has 3 affected sneezing offspring. Ah, explain the difference in the number of affected offspring for the sneezes in the two cases. So 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 will have it statistically in the pet in the Punnett square and you can draw the Punnett square. Exactly the same chance, which is 25% homozygous dominant, 50% heterozygote, and 25% homozygous recessive. But it's up to chance, because it's for every fertilization. Hence why the one has got three and the other one has got one, even though statistically they had the same chances. Okay, give the expected so that's it's basically one um, one homozygous sneezer. Oh no, phenotype ratio. Phenotype ratio is three sneezers to one non-sneezer, and account for every difference. So Punnett square shows 50%. This is because each of the offspring is independent. It's an independent event. So every fertilization is an independent event. Every fertilization is unaffected by the previous fertilization, and so each has a 50% chance of inheriting. Okay, we would expect a very close to 50 50 win as the number gets larger and larger and larger and larger. Um, oh, yeah, there's the 50 50. Okay, so we'll call it a day for today. I hope that helps you, and. Um, I'm going to upload some uh, site pad for you to do, so please can you jump on that for me. Okay, have a great day guys, thank you, bye.